we get a, a bit of feedback. Yes, we can hear you. All right. Yeah, okay. We now. So we'll get underway. Doctor's going to meet that mic over there. Hold on one second. All right. Try that. No, nope, that's still done. It. Hold on. Sherry, are you on line there? Yeah, it wasn't this one. It might have been you. She, because I just turned this one off. Oh, this is the feedback. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there you go. All right, does that work? Uh, feedback's gone? Good. Good. Good evening, everyone. This is a reg special meeting of the Board of Selectmen of the Town of New Canaan on Monday, June, January 24th, 2022 at 7.35 p.m. For the purpose of a, conducting a public information session regarding a new public safety cell tower that is being proposed by Homeland Towers and AT&T at 1837 Ponus Ridge Road. Uh, I'm present in person, Kathleen. Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Kathleen Corbett is here in person. I think Nick Nick is uh, is on by Zoom. He's joining, He's joining by Zoom, but anyway, we have we have a, we have a quorum to start. He's in. Okay, so we have a we have a all three of us here. We have a quorum. This meeting tonight is part of a ninety day consultation period with the town of New Canaan that began on December fourteenth and will extend until February fourteenth. I would note that Homeland Towers was selected by the town in August two thousand sixteen, pursuant to an RFP to be the town's partner in finding solutions to improving cell service in town. So I would like first to introduce and welcome Ray Brigatti of Homeland Towers, which is based in Danbury. Uh, for his presentation tonight, along with Homeless Council Lucia Chiocchio of the Cuddy Fader Law Firm. I'd also like to introduce and welcome AT&T's Community Relations Representative for this part of Connecticut, Harry Carey. Um, I would note that AT&T has been a leader in expanding cell service for the New Canaan residents and has worked continually over the past two decades to add cell service from new towers at the Country Club in McCain at Silver Hill Hospital, at the Armory site at Exit 38 on the Merritt Parkway, and most recently, the new tower at Soundview Lane. The need for improved cell service in the northwest section of town has been well documented over the last decade by the carriers and most recently by an independent consultant hired by the town, especially after the greatly expanded use of smartphones by virtually every adult and teenager in town. It's also important to note that quality cell service is now critical to the safety of our residents, since 70% of 911 calls nationwide are now made by cell phone. Quality cell service is also critical to our first responders. In times of emergencies, when the power goes out and residents lose their cable-based phone service, and our ambulances depend upon cell service for the data streams that tell our EMTs critical information about the patients they carry. Finally, and importantly, the proposed new tower at 1837 Ponus Ridge Road will provide an essential and permanent solution for antennas in the northwest corner of town for our public safety radio broadcasting network that supports police, fire, and ambulance vehicle, and handheld radios, which are essential to protecting both our first responders and our residents in that part of town. Before I uh, give the floor to Ray and Lucia, I'd like to ask Kathleen or Nick whether you would like to make a few comments. Only that I'm excited to uh, hear more about this, and uh, thank you and all of those who are participating this evening uh, for this opportunity to listen through the program. Nick, do you have any comments? Uh, I, I, I'm, like Kathleen, I'm looking forward to, uh, to this presentation. I think we've made great strides uh, in town, uh, Kevin, under your leadership in promoting cell phone towers. And uh, it, it's always been at the top of our list in terms of, uh, of you know, getting things done. It's, it's, it's a critical, critical to the town from uh, emergency perspective uh, to just, uh, you know, making our town more amenable to people looking to, to move out to Fairfield County. We, we've got to get better at cell phone coverage. So this is, a, this is an important step forward. Thank you, Nick. Uh, the process tonight will be uh, Ray and Lucia and Harry will give a presentation 50, 15 or 20 minutes, and then we'll take comments and questions both from the public in the, in the present here in the town hall, and then those by, by Zoom. You'll want to raise your electronic hand or your virtual hand on the Zoom in order to, for Tucker to recognize you. So uh, with that, Ray and Lucia and Harry, good to see you. Sorry about that. <laughs> 
Uh, so I'd like to uh, thank you, First Lessons, for having us and for setting up this meeting, and, and Corbett, thank you as well. Um, I'd like to uh, share my screen. Yeah, let me just get to you. You're muted. No, she's not muted. Here we go. Want to introduce your other colleague here? Yes. So, um, so as uh, first selection indicated, uh, to my right, there, Ray Bergatti from Homeland Towers. Uh, myself, Uchiha Kiyokyo with Kadeen Fader. Uh, to my left is Martin Lavin, uh, the radio frequency engineer for AT&T. And to his left is Harry Carey from AT&T. Uh, also joining us via Zoom are members of the team, Robert Burns, the civil engineer from All Points Technology, Brian Gaudet, project manager with All Points Technology, and Dean Gustafson, uh, the senior biologist with All Points Technology. And we will all be presenting uh, based on, on our tech report and information we provided. My understanding is that uh, the Council for Verizon, as well as Verizon's RF engineer, is, has also joined via Zoom. Verizon intends to uh, intervene in the site and council proceeding because they have a need to co-locate their equipment on the tower as well. So I'm going to begin by just briefly going over the site and council process. Uh, some of you may be familiar with this uh, a few years ago with the new tower on Sandview Lane. But in general, the Siding Council has exclusive jurisdiction over this type of facility. And what that means is the Siding Council is the ultimate determination of whether the site gets approved or not. The site does not have to go through local zoning um, for any kind of local zoning approval. However, we are here tonight as part of a mandatory uh, municipal consultation period that's required by the process in the state statutes. And that's a 90-day period where we talk with the town in meetings such as this one to get feedback, answer questions, and all of this information is incorporated into our siting council application. So the application will have all of our due diligence, the project team's due diligence, as well as any kind of responses to comments um, that have come out of this consultation process. Once the Siting Council application is ready to be filed, we file it with the Connecticut Siting Council. We also file it with several federal and state agencies, as well as the town. The town will receive several copies. Notice will be provided prior to filing. We have to notice our intent to file. So that will also be provided as part of the process. Once the Siting Council gets the application, they assign it a docket number, um, and then they start their process. Uh, they used to have a hearing um, as part of their process um, in town, uh, and then COVID hit. So with the executive order and the emergency situation with the pandemic, their hearings have been virtual. I don't know what's going to happen. They don't know what's going to happen in the future. So um, they may go back to having the hearings here at New Canaan, or it may be virtual. It may be a combination of both. We'll find out when we get there. But at the very least, we're not filing our application until probably mid-March or, or late March. Um, so what's the purpose of tonight? Tonight is to give you an overview of what the proposal is. Uh, to listen to comments and concerns, try to answer as many questions as we can, um, and discuss follow-up and how we're going to incorporate some of those, those comments into our application. So what the Siding Council does, they, they don't follow strictly the local regulations. What they do is they balance the need for a facility with the environmental impact. They do look at the local regulations for guidance, but they don't have specific setbacks, uh, height requirements, and, and things like that. So we have to 
demonstrate that there's a public need or there's a need for this tower. And we also have to demonstrate that any potential environmental impacts are mitigated. So with respect to public need, we have some statistics we're sharing with you about um, 911 calls, 80% are made from the mobile phone. As of June, 2020, there were 442.5 million wireless devices in the US. <laughs> What I thought was very interesting was some of the results uh, from the pandemic. I'm sure everybody realizes with the pandemic and the shutdown, uh, everybody relied on, on reliable wireless service to get things done, work done, school, health, get your groceries delivered. I mean, it, it was really quite uh, extraordinary. And with respect to at and specific need, um, the as First Electrical indicated, the town did commission an independent study which demonstrated a need in the northwest section of, of the town. Um, and Verizon's also uh, indicated that they have a need for this facility. And with that, oh, public need. Uh, we also have emergency communications uh, that need the power. AT&T will deploy FirstNet services from this facility. And what FirstNet is, it's a it's a dedicated, prioritized criteria that I typically um, need to look for is that the site has to be uh, has to work for the carriers. And what I mean by that is it has to work for their network. I can't build a site a half mile away from another site because there's already pretty much existing coverage there. These sites are typically spaced out depending on terrain, topography, and so forth. You know, every two miles, maybe a mile and a half uh, in proximity to each other. Um, the site has to be, have decent elevation because this is line of sight technology. It is terrain driven. So it, um, it just has to work well for the carriers. And in addition, we're really finding these days that um, because this is so critical, that public safety has to work for them as well. And, um, and we're glad in this case it does. We, we like working with public safety folks. It's uh, very important. Um, last is the number four criteria that I look at um, in doing this business is the site has to be uh, zonable and constructible. And what I mean by that is uh, I can't build it in the middle of a swamp on an island. Uh, yes, you can almost engineer anything these days, but uh, within reason, obviously. So the site has to uh, be zonable. I look for a site that has the least uh, obtrusive visually to an area, almost putting my hat on if I were to live there to say, where can a spot go, a tower go, that's going to fit into the community and be an appropriate site. So these are the criteria that I look for. Uh, when I look at sites, I did roughly 24, uh, two dozen or so uh, sites that were investigated. You can see my site search map in and around the area. Um, the number one in red is the proposed location at 1837 Ponus and all the numbers um, correspond in our application to uh, other properties that receive proposals or were looked at by home and towers. Thank you, Ray. Um, and with that, I'll turn it over to uh, Bob Burns, Robert Burns, uh, our design engineer, going to be Zoom. I'll ask him to talk a little bit about the proposal, the specific for the proposal. Thank you, Lucia. Um, for the record, my name is Robert Burns. I'm a licensed civil engineer with All Points Technology Corporation, and I was responsible for the civil engineering design on this project. Uh, the site, as has already been mentioned, is located at 1837 Ponus Ridge Road, which is the north side of Ponus Ridge Road, just west of the intersection with Dan's Highway. Uh, can, uh, can we go to the next slide, please? The map. Yeah, per perfect. Uh, the, the compound itself will be located on the northeast side of the parcel. Uh, north in the, on this map is sort of up and to the left. Um, the entrance off Ponus Ridge Road will be via an existing curb cut. Uh, it's the driveway to 1837 Ponus Ridge Road, so there will be no new curb cut. Uh, the site will be accessed from a 12 foot wide, approximately 500 foot long, uh, partially paved, partially gravel access driveway, which commences at the driveway for the existing, uh, which commences at the existing driveway for 1837 Ponus Ridge Road, and then runs onto the private property. 
uh, and a circuitous route up to the top. The compound itself is a 3,000 square foot irregularly shaped gravel surface compound. It's surrounded by an eight foot high chain link fence with a 12 foot wide access gate on the northern side. The compound itself has been sized for four carriers, AT&T, Verizon, and two future carriers, and room for uh, municipal equipment if, they, uh, if there's a need for ground equipment to uh, go with the antennas that are going on the tower for the municipality. Uh, we can go to the next slide. There you go. Uh, outside the fence on the southwest side of the compound is a proposed utility area, which will include a utility backboard, which will ha house the proposed electric meters, an electric transformer, and a small telephone cabinet. This area will be surrounded with steel by steel bollards for protection. The proposed electric and telco service that will feed the site will be installed underground beginning at an existing utility pole on the south side of Ponus Ridge Road and run underground across the street and then follow the proposed driveway up and to the utility area. Inside the fence in the northeast corner of the compound is AT&T's ground equipment which will include an eight foot eight inch by eight foot eight inch concrete pad with a um, they call it a wick, but it's a walk-in cabinet, which is a, essentially a very small shelter. Um, and a nine foot by seven foot concrete pad, which will have a 15 kW uh, kilowatt diesel fire generator on for backup power for AT&T's equipment. In the, uh, uh, in the compound itself is a 110 foot high monopine. Uh, with municipal 10 antennas, uh, which will reach the height of 125 on the top of that municipal antenna. The town's plan is to install a whip antenna at the top and room for two future small microwave dishes. They're two foot dishes, they're small, at the top, which will serve the town. And they'll also be installing a whip antenna at the 60 foot level. AT&T's plan is at uh, plan at 106 is to install six panel antennas, nine remote radio heads, and three um, squid boxes, which will be mounted on T arms. The center of those antennas will be at 106. The T arms will also be small enough so that the all of AT&T's antennas and their appurtenances will be within the branches of the monopine. In addition to the antennas themselves, will be fitted with um, socks will be painted and fitted with socks so that they blend in with the branches of the monopon. The tower will also be designed for three additional carriers, Verizon at 96, and then two future carriers below that at 10 foot intervals. Surrounding the compound itself, we're proposing eight to 10 foot tall proposed plantings on the northeast and th southeast side of the proposed compound for screening. And that is, in a nutshell, the, the design itself. Thank you. I just ask the, the trees that are planted around, are they, did they go in at full height or are they expected to grow over time? Uh, they go in at full height. So we spec out eight to 10 foot high, that's what we'll be put in. We're still playing around with the species. I know these plants say arborvitae, but uh, the deer tend to like the arborvitae, so we may swap it out for a different type of, type of evergreen. What, did, what exactly is going to be, you're going to be able to see from uh, either Dan's Highway or Ponus if you're driving down the road? I think that we're, there's a whole visual part of this where they'll have some uh, photos and some photo sims that might help a little better. Okay. Um, so uh, I would stay tuned for that. Okay, thanks. <laughs> You're welcome. Thank you, Bob. Thank you. Well, I, I would ask the question to Ray, is this the same type of tree that Soundview Lane has? It will be. The, the type of tree that was built at Soundview had a, a height of 85 feet with a five foot faux top, so 90 feet overall. This is currently planned at 110 with a five foot faux top for 115. 
um, we would basically do the same type of tree. And I say evergreen tree, conical shaped. Um, you have the option of doing conical or non-uniform um, tree. Um, but yes, to answer your question, it'd be very similar, if not the same type of product that we've done at Soundview. Hey, Ray, while, while you're here, <laughs> um, can you just update us briefly on Soundview? Sure. Um, who am I speaking with? I'm sorry. Nick Williams. Oh, hi, Nick. Selectman. It's, uh, it's right. Nice to meet you through Zoom. Um, the update right now on Soundview is the site is uh, uh, constructed. Uh, AT&T has installed their antennas. Uh, there's power at the site. Um, they are in the midst of bringing fiber to the site. I believe they are targeting uh, an on-air date um, end of April, if I recall seeing uh, a date. Um, I was telling your first selectman, it takes a little while for the carriers to integrate the site into their network, but right now they are targeting the end of April. Um, if they are able to uh, bring that date forward, um, they certainly will. Um, there will be some additional landscaping going in as well once the springtime is upon us. And as additional update, I can say, and I'm happy to say that there are two other carriers in the wings that are planning on coming on board for that tower. That's great to hear. That's great to hear. Thank you, Ray. Um, so I'd like to turn it over to uh, Dean Gustafson to talk a little bit about the environmental due diligence we've uh, done, the project team has done for the site. Great, thank you, Lucia. Good evening, everyone. My name is Dean Gustafson with All Points. I'm a senior biologist and senior wetland scientist. Um, there are a variety of environmental resources that were evaluated in accordance with the Connecticut Siting Council regulations. Uh, and I'll briefly discuss three of them. Um, first, for wetlands, the project will not have an adverse effect on wetland resources. Uh, there was one uh, forested hillside seep wetland that was identified along the western property boundary um, that's located approximately 137 feet west of the proposed access road at the nearest point of the construction activities to wetland resources. Uh, that wetland system drains to the south um, and eventually enters Lowell Reservoir. Uh, the project will uh, include a, a robust uh, compilation of erosion and sedimentation controls um, that will be implemented and maintained throughout construction to ensure that uh, those nearby wetland and water resources will be protected during construction of the facility. Uh, the second resource is uh, historic. Uh, the project has initiated the Connecticut State Historic Preserva Preservation Office consultation process and will work with this office to ensure the project will not have any adverse effect on historic or cultural resources. Uh, and finally, the third is uh, you know, wildlife uh, impacts have been evaluated. Uh, we've completed our consultation with the Connecticut Department of Energy and Environmental Protection's Natural Resource uh, Diversity Database, uh, which uh, identified three rare species known to occur in the vicinity of the proposed project. Uh, there's two bat species and one turtle, and there will be various protection measures that are approved by DEEP that will be employed during construction to avoid any adverse impact to these rare species. With that, I turn it back over to Lucia. Thank you, Dean. And, and um, I'll talk about this, this last box on the slide with respect to um, emissions and power density. Um, we have to demonstrate, at and and Verizon, all the carriers, have to demonstrate that their facilities comply with the applicable standards with respect to emissions. And the applicable standards are federal standards. So the federal government has established very conservative standards. We have the radio frequency engineers do the analysis and we have to demonstrate that we comply. Once we demonstrate compliance with those federal standards, the siting council um, cannot make their decision based on perceived health effects. So it's up to us to show we meet those standards. And then once we do, the siting council as they have to be satisfied with that and, and say, okay, you've met those specific standards. I just ask a question. Does the siting council just accept your reports or do they do their own due diligence about they, those? They typically accept the reports okay. because the, it, it is a detailed analysis. Sure. And the government has set out 
This standards. is the calculation. Right. This is how you do it. These are the inputs for it. And the siding council has been doing this for quite a few years, right? Sure. So they, they understand that that's, that's what's needed. Right. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Um, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to Brian Gaudet um, of our team. And Brian's going to talk a little bit about uh, the visual analysis that you see here. Um, and we do have some photosims that we'll run through. Uh, and with that, I'll turn it over to Brian. Thank you, Lucia. Uh, as she mentioned, I'm Brian Gaudet. I'm a project manager with All Points. Um, one of the other environmental impacts that we are are required to evaluate for the siting council is the visual impact. Um, so it's a, it's a fairly detailed process that we go through to demonstrate what the visual impacts may or may not be. Um, the state of Connecticut uses a two mile study area. So it's a two mile radius from the point of the site. Um, that's shown on the, on the uh, graphic here in that black outline. The first step in our process uh, is creating um, what would be a preliminary viewshed map. So the viewshed map, as you see here, um, has been refined based on some, some field uh, reconnaissance that we did uh, after flying a balloon back in April. Uh, but the viewshed map, essentially what it, what it does is we, we take data, um, it's called LIDAR. It's a, a laser, basically a, a laser data set that provides us uh, detailed information on what the heights of trees, buildings, things like that are in combination with topography in an area. From there, we input our, our data. So in this case, the facility height of 115 feet above ground level. And we use a viewshed mapping tool, which provides an output that predicts where either seasonal, which would be um, visibility as we have now with leaves off the deciduous trees, or year-round visibility. So when you can see it uh, either through or above trees in the summertime and springtime. Um, what you see here, the yellow, the bright yellow is the predicted year-round visibility. The orange is predicted seasonal visibility. So I, I, I mentioned the, the process for that um, with it being a preliminary analysis first. Here, this is the, the final uh, field verified data. So we find often that the preliminary analysis without doing any any field work, um, going out, flying a balloon, doing a crane test, anything like that, often over predicts visibility because the, the tool itself is telling you that if, if you can see one inch of this tower from a certain point, um, they're calling that as visible. Whereas in, in reality, something two miles away you're not gonna visibly notice one inch of a tower uh, as you're driving down the street. So we send a, a team out into the field um, with our, our field map, which is that preliminary view shed. We drive every street um, within this two mile radius. We are looking for either, in this case, it was a balloon. So we fly a, a red helium filled balloon to a, a height of 115 feet to demonstrate the tower. It allows us to spot that as we're, we're going through doing our field research. I believe that was publicly notified uh, back in April as well. Um, once we finish our, our field review, we, we then compile the data uh, in areas where it may have been over predicted that there was visibility. Uh, in this case, I'll use Rock Rim and Country Club. Uh, there was no visibility up there, uh, but our preliminary data showed that there was. Um, so that gets refined down to what this final data set is. You can see here, uh, it, it might be tough to read, but in the legend, um, we've got the call outs of what the predicted acreage of visibility is. That's the calculation that we use uh, to, to really quantify what the visibility may be. Um, so it's an eight, 8,042 square acre uh, study area. Predicted year-round visibility here is 198 acres, give or take, with 195 of that occurring over the reservoir, which is not accessible by the public. Uh, predicted seasonal visibility is 80 acres. Um, I believe it was about 59 acres or so uh, occur over the 
reservoir property as well. So all in all, we're looking at less than 1% of predicted visibility, um, which is a, a very low number uh, when you think about publicly accessible uh, and, and not just publicly accessible, but uh, certainly this takes into account uh, nearby residential properties as well. Um, we can go down to the next slide, which I believe are the photos. Could I make? I'm not sure if everybody's following this. Could I? Yeah, sure. Could I just make a, have Ray make a clarification? So basically, what he's saying is, there's no visibility from the south, east, or the north. It's really to the west, and west is really all reservoir. Is that what he's saying? Yes. Right. Right. So that, uh, and you know, I've I've looked across the reservoir from the Stanford side, and I don't know what the distance is there, but you know, if, to the to the naked eye, you can you, you can't see much across the from the others from, from Stanford at all. So, how, how many contiguous property owners are there to this to this parcel? Two, I or, believe or three. There's three. Uh, one is vacant. Three of butters. Yes, one's a vacant one, parcel. One is vacant, and then there's the Smiths and the Bushmans. Right. Okay. Thank you. But even Nick, the the point is that given the the configuration of the topography, e even the the neighbors on Dan's Highway can't see, you know, it's you really, it, it's a unique location. That's partly why it works. No, 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 it's a great location. <laughs> it's like, I, I, I could, you, you couldn't, you couldn't pick a better spot, frankly, to shore it's, up. The uh, it, certainly evaluating visibility for towers, there, there aren't many that uh, come as nice as this one when you look at it from a quantitative level. Um, and that's not to take away that, there is visibility and certainly some people will see it uh, where others may not. Um, but, but yes, it, generally this is a very good site from a, a visibility standpoint. Right. Are there any photos of the, of the balloon test? Or is that what yeah, we have a few photos here. So um, right now we're looking, this is um, just Northwest of the site on Pontus Ridge. Um, you can see the red arrow you'll see in these photos is pointing out the balloon because again, it, it's, it can be somewhat difficult to pick out depending on the distances here. Um, so we're, we're about an eighth of a mile away here. Um, and if you go to the next photo, the, the photographic simulations here are representative uh, generally of what the tower will, will appear to be. Um, it is designed as a monopine tower uh, we have included the municipal whip antennas on there as well. I'll point out that the whip antennas, um, and you may have noticed on the on the site plans, those are not going to be uh, enclosed by the the branching. Typically, beyond about a quarter mile, those whip antennas are not typically discernible by the naked eye. Um, so, from a visual perspective you would really be increasing the visibility of a tower if we were to increase another 10 feet of branching to simply enclose a roughly three inch diameter uh, whip antenna. So I don't know if you'll be able to pick it out in these. Um, certainly in the full application, we'll have a, a complete visual analysis, which some of those photos you might be able to pick it out a little bit clearer. This is a again generally same distance, about a tenth of a mile away this time, um, down towards the corner of Dan's Highway. Um, you can sort of see the balloon through there. We've got the red arrow there as well. And again, it's pretty pretty thick tree cover here. Uh, and this and is leaves off, off in April. This is leaf off in April, correct? Um, so there you can see, uh, you know, through the trees, you can see the tower um, again pretty well well masked uh, with that monopine structure. Are trees gonna have to be cut down to provide for the tower? There will be tree clearing involved here. Um, we do account for that in our visibility analysis, both in the view shed mapping uh, and the simulations as best we can. Um, I don't have the specific number offhand. Mr. Burns might be able to answer that if, uh, if you so desire. Yeah, so as part of the construction of the site, uh, once again, Robert Burns, um, uh, the siting council has us catalog every tree six inches in diameter and greater to, that'll be removed. And on this, uh, for construction of the site, there'll be 118 trees that'll be removed. 
Okay. It's mainly to, to for the roadway up to the top and the the, the, the uh, Yes, it's entirely for the compound construction. Itself. Of, yes, entirely for the driveway and the compound construction. Correct. Do you have a sense of what the largest tree would be? Offhand, I do not. Um, I, uh, we certainly could get that information for you. Thank you. Photo 11 here is a a representative shot. Um, you'll see the distance here is 0.3 miles. This is to the southeast. Um, I would say the majority of the visibility for this site is going to be within a quarter mile, um, both seasonal and year round, aside from what is seen over the reservoir. Um, so you can see here, the balloon's not visible through the trees here. Um, I want to point out that seasonal visibility, right? These are static photos. Uh, when we're out in the field, what we do is we bracket visibility. So as we're driving um, in any in any situation on any streets, we as soon as we see the balloon, we we notate that as whether it's seasonal or year round. Uh, we then backtrack to where the balloon falls out of view, and then we go forward to where it falls out of view again. So while some of these photos are static in nature, um, we do, you know, it, the visibility can change, right? From, from five feet to the left, 10 feet to the right, uh, depending on the branching of the intervening trees. Um, so that is evaluated, but I just wanted to point that out as, as we're looking at these static shots. This is uh, north of the site, looking down Squires Lane. Um, Again, we're about just under a quarter mile out. You can sort of see the balloon there. And then the next shot will show the tree in there. Um, so again, it, it you know, it, it's going to blend in, in in areas, you know, here you can see more of the tower itself in terms of the, the height of the facility being visible in the photo. Um, whereas the, the two locations down on Pontus Ridge, you're looking up. So you've got the benefit of the hillside blocking off the bottom portion of the tower where this one, you're, you're closer to level with it. Uh, but again, generally blends in fairly well with the, the existing trees. Could you go back to the last slide? And it, it, so yeah, are you superimposing the tree there? Is that superimposed? Yeah, so it's, it's you know, when you're dealing with such thick, tree coverage, it, it does, I, I think you're asking that the, it sort of looks like it pops out in front of the, the trees that are there. Um, part of that is that we're trying to incorporate the tree removal that will occur. Um, so there will be some, some opening back near the compound just from the sense that we have to remove some of those trees to install the facility. Okay. So the denseness of that wooded area um, in that location will be slightly less once the facility is up. And that's what we're trying to portray here. Yeah. I recall looking at it from the Stanford side, a lot of the trees are higher than the balloon because they're 90 foot pines and stuff up, up on the, on the top of the ridge. So. Yep, exactly. And with that, I'll, I'll give it back to Lucia. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Um, so as I said earlier, um, once we work through the municipal consultation process, um, we will file an application with the siting council, um, receive a copy, we'll have notice of that, and, um, and then starting siting council will start their process. So we will incorporate comments from tonight into our application, um, and we're happy to answer as many questions as we can. So you, you submitted a, a package about an inch and a half thick, and all that's available. We have it on the town website. People can go through it. Um, we'll take your take comments up to February 14th, basically. That's the period that we're in, ending our municipal consultation. So I think our planning and zoning commission is going to discuss this tomorrow night at their meeting, um, and they will be providing comments. I don't know if anybody from PNC wants to make a comment tonight uh, on here. They're welcome to. 
Um, we will take public comment, though, especially the young couple here <laughs> present, which uh, has a young child. And we, and we so the process will be um, uh, let's we'll take comments from the public first here in the room. Um, we have some uh, of our public safety officers here and present and on the on the uh, on Zoom that may wish to make some comments, but um, and questions. Anyone who wants to ask questions or or make comments. So Justin and and do you want to go now? We have a. Yeah. Sure, sure. We have a neighbor from Squires Lane. If you could come to the podium and introduce yourself. Ty, uh, Tucker, do you have to turn that mic on? You know, it's on. I, I ended up turning that computer off because we were getting feedback. So just speak there. They can hear you. Okay, I'll remove my mask. To identify yourself and. Yeah, absolutely. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Thank you everyone for hearing us out this evening. Um, I really appreciate it. Uh, my name is Rose Nishioka. I'm on 60 Squires Lane. I'm here with my husband and our young daughter, Adelaide. And I just wanted to say a couple comments. We, um, we moved out here from California and growing up as a little girl, I grew up about an hour outside of Tahoe. It was a really rural town, not very many people, not very many opportunities. And um, about 600 people. And I promised myself that I would make something of myself and I would get an education and which I did. I went to law school, graduated. I'm actually an attorney. And I promised myself that my kids would have an opportunity that I didn't have growing up and that they would be raised in a community that cared for them, that um, provided a wonderful education for them, that deeply cared about their health and about their safety. And so I speak to you this evening because my husband and I coming from California, we sat down and we said, where in the United States do we want to live? And we researched this very, very carefully. And we chose New Canaan. And so we moved here a couple, couple years ago with our four-year-old. We have a four-year-old son, Fox, and we have a daughter, Adelaide, who's one. And this was a dream of ours to come here. And we found the most beautiful house on the most beautiful property. And today I ironically stand before you and it's undisputed. There's research out there. There's tons of research articles, which I plead that you educate yourself on about the negative effects on young children, not adults as well, but young children specifically on cell towers. And having these young children who play outside, who kick the leaves in the fall, who slide down our driveway sledding in the winter time where we have snowball fights, to play underneath this cell tower that's a little over 500 feet away from us is extremely gut-wrenching. And ironically, we came here as a place, as a community that loved children. It's a darling town. We've met very many wonderful people. And to have that ripped away tonight, being fairly new to the community, we were just notified about this. Um, and that the health and safety of our children will be at risk as they play outside and as they grow up here is something that we don't want, is something that we would have never, ever, ever, ever done if we would have known. And it not only impact, impacts our children, we're at 60 Squires, our neighbors, the Smiths, they have four lovely children. They're also very young. They also oppose this. We have the Lewises that live next door to us. They have children and grandchildren, which visit often, and they also do oppose this. They weren't able to make it tonight. And then the Lascos that live across from us, we were not able to contact them in time because we were just notified of this of this morning, but they also have two young children in the area. And so we're not disputing, we want great cell coverage, yes, but I think there's a number of different different locations, as was discussed earlier, that wouldn't have such a negative impact, such a harmful impact on the safety and the health of our young children. So I appreciate your time. Um, and I just, I really do plead and I ask for just a thoughtful, thoughtful um, response on this and before anything permanent moves forward. Thank you. Justin, did you want to speak as well? Thank you for having us. My name is Justin Nishioka. You just heard from my um, my wife, who 
I think it stated it certainly better than I will. But um, of course, we're concerned about the safety. Uh, we have some plans in terms of what we're hoping to do with this house that we were able to get here again, which is just a dream. We never saw ourselves living somewhere like here, but we both worked hard and we somehow managed to sneak into your community. And um, this site uh, is directly adjacent to a land swap that we have with our, our neighbors, the Smiths, who are adjacent to this property. And um, that swap was approved by um, this, the town of New Canaan. And we were planning and hoping to develop that plot for a place for our kids to play. Um, it's now gonna be in such close proximity to this cell tower that um, we, we're just worried about their health. I, th I think also, and possibly more importantly, is I just don't think that this environmental assessment as presented in the pack, and I tried to look at it again, it was an inch and a half thick, but I paid particular attention to section four, which was on the environmental impacts, because I do know that just this last month recently, December, 2021, a new um, critical habit, habitat chart was made by the um, state's environmental commission or environmental um, whatever organization oversees the environment. And just in December of 2021, it designated a, some very, very small areas of New Canaan as critical habitats for endangered species. This cell tower squarely falls within that critical habitat, that newly designated critical habitat, where, as noted in, in the presentation, there are protected species that certainly weren't considered in the packet that we saw in that section four, which would make that environmental assessment insufficient in terms of expressing the true environmental impacts that it could have on these protected species. And we'd hope that certainly uh, at the very least a review could be done into how this newly designated area again where this cell tower squarely falls into as well as the um our our family and the our neighbors um into this very small designated critical habitat area that the state has designated as a place that we need to protect the again the environmental assessment does not take that into account and therefore it just doesn't provide enough information to support our community support for this project um again i thank you so much for your time um we're excited to be residents but we are very concerned and certainly opposed to the cell tower thank you thank you justin uh Jeff, would you like to speak? Are you here, here to speak? Okay. Um, okay, again, you need to raise your hand on the Zoom hand so the Tucker can identify you and then unmute you. First was Jane Raveretz. Jane. If you'd identify your name and address when you, when you comment or question. Hi, sorry, I had some trouble unmuting. Um, I just wanted to be clear about a couple of things. I did hear Jane, someone- Jane, Jane, could you state your name and your address? Oh, sorry, I'm Jane Ravarette and I live at 331 Dan's Highway. Um, first of all, I heard somebody say that we the, the balloon was not visible from the, three, from the Dan's Highway properties. We were here on the day that the balloon was flown and we saw it from many different vantage points on our property. So it's definitely visible from Dan's Highway um, and from our property, from our driveway, from our backyard, from our side yard, from other places in the yard. Um, so I just wanted to clarify that. Um, and then in regards to the process of this, I would certainly hope we are older residents who have raised five children in this community. I would hope that we would be paying attention to the younger members of this community who will keep this community alive and keep this community growing and that we will listen to their concerns. I feel like this process in general has been shoved through and that many people in the community have not been told about this and that it was done during the COVID period when many people were not aware of what was going on 
There was a petition circulated when this first came up that disappeared. So I, I really hope that we're living in a community that does support families with children because that's what New Canaan has always been. And that is what attracts people to our community. And frankly, the real estate prices and the ability to sell property depends on that. That's what I'll have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Jane. Mark, there you go. Yes, hi, thank you very much. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank my neighbors for their uh, thoughtful comments as well, which um, I will certainly echo. My name is Mark Bushman. Uh, we live on 359 Dance Highway. We have, my wife and I, Jamie, have four kids, ages 13, 11, eight, and seven. So very young kids. Our concerns are, are, are multiple. Obviously the health um, of our children, uh, our property values. And lastly, I'll touch on just this process, which has been flawed. And frankly, um, the last caller said it correctly, has been done in the middle of the night. These are the same issues that have been raised lastly through the whole song view process, um, which obviously also got a ton of opposition um, as the sitting council obviously know. Um, I doubt anything I'm gonna say will sway you, um, but I wanna make sure that you, know, you hear at least from the neighbors who are directly impacted in our opposition against this. And at least in Soundview, we're talking about a tower at the very least was 84, 85 feet, as Mr. Vergati had told you, as opposed to 110 feet, which is materially larger and, and more imposing. I've spoken to Ray Vergati multiple times. I've met with him, he's a very nice man, um, but there's been zero, and I mean absolutely zero mitigation and, and, and Mr. Moynihan, I met with you in your office as well one time. There's been zero mitigation over the years this has happened to actually mitigate the impact of this tower. One, the height has always been 110 because, quote unquote, that's what the carriers demand. We talk about safety. I'll get to that in a second. Um, we're certainly happy to consider that. Screening a bunch of 10-foot trees against a 110-foot tower there's been zero attempt to screen this from the people who are actually directly impacted by this. Again, do not tell me that a 10 foot tree next to a 110 foot tower will do anything other than block the generator, which at the very least you guys can do. Lastly, any form of compensation to those who are affected both by property values and potential health issues. There's been absolutely none. Who actually has liability here? If something were to happen with this tower, who is liable? I'll talk about 1837 LLC in a second, um, but this is one of those another, another issues that we certainly have. Uh, we were promised many times pictures with superimposed pines from our property, so we actually would know what it would look like, and nothing. Never received them. Mr. Vergati promised them. There was absolutely nothing. The, the balloon test, which Mr. Vergati had told me about, frankly, it was not made public. He told me about it, and he frankly asked me not to tell the neighbors about it. It was moved a couple of days in April because of wind conditions. There was no wide public announcement of the balloon test. So I'm happy some neighbors saw it. The fact they saw it just tells you just how imposing the actual balloon was because it was not something that as this hearing was made public, was made public to anybody that is around. On the health issue, real quick, I cannot do, do nearly as enough justice as the first two speakers said in regards to the impact of, of uh, radio frequencies on health. But I would just note, because uh, we do talk about uh, this a lot, that um, the International Association of Firefighters oppose using their fire stations as bases for cell towers because of the potential impact on the central nervous system, the immune system, and other health impacts. So we cannot say that there is absolutely no discussion around the safety and health on radio frequencies. It is, has been discussed. There's a lot out there. There's a lot to be concerned about. In regards to property values, common sense would dictate, given that a choice between a house with a cell phone tower looming over it and one without 
no one would choose to purchase a home near a cell tower. It's a great quote. I wish it was mine. In fact, it's actually from the New Canaan Utilities Commission. You, in fact, have absolutely admitted the fact that no one's going to want to buy a home that has a cell tower next to it, and it does impact values. Again, zero compensation that's been given to any of the neighbors who are directly impacted. And by the way, Mr. Smith and I, I believe he is 300 feet from the fence. Uh, his fence line is 300 feet from the tower. I think I'm 400. So we are right next to it, directly next to it. Let's talk about the process because that is frankly one of the more shocking things about all of this. Uh, as the last person mentioned, uh, we actually led a public campaign against the cell tower when it was supposed to go on the Aquarian land across from 1837 bonus. Within a number of days, and I mean two or three, we had over 500 signatures on change.org going against a cell tower in this area. In the deck that you have up, you've put out there and the number of sites that Mr. Ragatti supposedly went to and the homes that he had uh, spoke to asking them if they wanted a cell phone tower, they all said no. So clearly the people on Dan's Highway and Squires Lane and those affected by it actually do not want a cell phone tower near them. North Stamford, the ones that actually are crossing the reservoir, there was supposed to be a cell tower there as well. The residents there defeated it because they didn't want it. Apparently in North Stamford, the community there or the mayor cares more about the citizens than they do in New Canaan. So again, there's a long list of people here who are very clear that they do not want this. And I still get outraged emails to this day, even though this petition was years ago, people asking about the status of this tower and if it was going up. And so this day was inevitable and that's why you have these people on the phone, but, um, but it is what it is. So let's talk about actually how this even came about. Hey, hey Mark, we have to limit comments to a reasonable period of time. Yeah, so. I only have two more minutes, sir. This will be very quick. This site came about when a shadowy LLC called 1837 bought the land from Dr. Barron. Dr. Barron had previously been uh, approached by Homeland to sell to the property to them. They did not want that. They did not want a cell tower on their property. However, they were happy to sell to what was 1837 LLC because that was to be someone who wanted to buy the home and keep the land as is, as Ms. Barron told us. However, 1837, when you contact them through the Rucci Law Firm, this is actually an investment property. The actual owner of the, of the LLC, who we have not been able to figure out who that is, and I wish somebody would, actually does not live there. The home is rented out. So this is an outside party in effect buying land and renting out a home and renting out the entire land to homeland for this lease of the cell tower. So the person who actually owns it isn't even affected. So this is not even comparable to Soundview, where at least Mr. Ritchie, for you know, whatever his judgment is, but at least was impacted by the cell tower. In this case, 1837 absolutely is not. So we don't even know who is actually liable, who is there. It's just a, a complete, it's a complete mystery to us. So let me just conclude that we absolutely recognize that first responders, fire and safety, police, absolutely, that's something that we are very concerned about and wanna make sure that they have all the proper resources uh, that they need to do their job. The question here is, is the 110 foot tower really what they need? So far, the, the idea of the safety and the fire and the police always seems to be the Trojan horse to then allow 110 foot tower, which really is all about making money and for AT&T and to have commercial viability for that tower. So again, in the end here, this is not the last tower for all the citizens that are listening to this, that this town is gonna have. The next tower could very well come to the property next to yours. And all you have to have is a, a third party buy that property and claim that this is for the, the good of the town and anything can be done there. This town has an ordinance against blight where if you don't paint your house or you don't pick up your trash or you have trees that are fallen, you can be cited. But somehow at a 110 foot tower right next to your property seems to be okay. So Mr. Moynihan, Mr. Williams, you both made campaign promises on cell phone towers. I understand that. 
I recommend that you put those on your properties as opposed to ours. Thank you very much. John Goodwin, Chairman of Pl uh, Planning and Zoning Commission. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. First Blackman. Yes, John Goodwin, 70 Bayberry Road, but I'm speaking in my capacity as the Chair of New Cleaning Planning and Zoning Commission. Um, for the applicant team, and as the first selectman noted, uh, tomorrow evening, the PNZ Commission will discuss uh, the application in regular meeting mode and as it relates to the guidelines that we've outlined. And it would be helpful to the commission if the applicant team could discuss um, how the uh, proposed tower um, fits to or does not fit to PNZ section 7.8.F and 7.8G. Um, so if they're willing to discuss now, I don't know if uh, that works in terms of Mr. F First Selectman, how you're running the process, but it would be more efficient. And then in particular, I noted uh, particularly interested in uh, more information on the equipment shelter and screening and uh, any consideration of alternative uh, technologies to the tower as uh, proposed. Great. Ray, did you, do you want to address that? Um, sure, we can... Um... As part of the siting council application, uh, we do do an analysis of the town's regulations and, and how the facility may or may not comply. Um, the specific provisions, um, I, I'm not sure the, if, Chairman Goodman, if you could repeat those provisions. Uh, could, you, could you cite the provision and what it, what, what it requires? Yeah, as I emailed yesterday, you're pretty familiar with it. It's it's sections uh, same 7.8.8F and 7.8G. It was the same sections we discussed during the Soundview application. So they regarded uh, 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 our, our guidelines around type of technology, preferred, not preferred for a cell tower, as well as potential screening, as well as uh, how you would um, set up around the installation, as well as other provisions. But with respect to technology, um, as you saw earlier with the radio frequency coverage maps, uh, the area that needs to be covered is, is a significant gap. So the only technology that's available is, is something that's what's proposed, a tower. A, a small cell or a distributed antenna system would not provide the coverage that's needed in this area. Um, there's also a lot of limitations with respect to that type of technology. Um, that, that limit its use in an area such as this. So with respect to technology, you're really looking at a, uh, a tower facility. Uh, it is designed as a monopine to try and mitigate the visual impacts to the greatest extent practicable. Um, with respect to the compound area, um, there, the entire compound will be uh, enclosed with a fence. Uh, significant plantings are, are proposed around that area. So it's not anticipated that the equipment in the compound will be visible. Um, and as you saw from the photosims, there's a lot of mature vegetation in the area that will also screen the, the facility. Um, but we'll provide a lot more detail with respect to that in our siting council application. And I know with the Soundview Lane uh, proposal, the Planning and Zoning Commission did uh, provide a letter discussing what they had, uh, summarizing what they had discussed at their meeting and, and we're happy to respond in our siting council application to more specifics. Thank you. You know, I would make a comment at this juncture. Um, I often make the comparison to New York City. Or Man Manhattan, the island of Manhattan is in, in landmass the same size as the, at New Canaan, Connecticut. They're two by 12 miles, we're four by six miles. And to cover such a landmass, you really require macro sites. The carriers regard New Canaan as, as semi-rural, um, and you really can't get coverage given the miles and miles of uh, territory we have in New Canaan without macro sites. Um, so um, uh, that's, you know, I think in Manhattan, they have 14,000 antenna locations. We have five locations in New Canaan. That's why we have the gaps. That's why we have the places where people have no coverage at all. Um, and also, you know, for public safety, you know, we tried to get a, a public safety tower approved um, on Stanford property at the base of the reservoir, and Stanford did de uh, defeat it because um, it wasn't in. It gave them no benefit. This this cell tower will give Stanford residents in. in they have as bad a problem in Northeast Stanford as we have in Northwest Canaan. So um, I think the uh, the residents of the uh, Northeast 
Stanford will have a different attitude since this tower is in the Canaan, but will give them benefit than they did with respect to the public safety antenna only that they, they, they defeated, so. Thank you. Sure. So, so Tucker is asking anyone who wishes to speak, if you could pr provide your name on your uh, on your Zoom rather than just a phone number, and then we'll grant you access to comment. Uh, raise your hand on Zoom. It's uh, Andrew Sin. Andrew. Yes, um, Andrew Sin, Heritage Hill Road. Um, I just had a couple, couple of technical questions. These antennas, are they omnidirectional? Question one. And question two, um, how much RF radiation are we talking about as compared with Wi-Fi inside a home? Uh, Smart 11 uh, for at and the antennas are directional panel antennas, uh, three sector design. Um, and I can't really compare this specifically to a specific um, Wi Fi installation in anyone's home. Thank you. Next. Mr. Wiley. You, Wiley? Uh, good evening. Good evening, gentlemen. Can you see me, hear me? Yes. yes. Thank you, First Selectman. Um, having, uh, for, uh, for the record, my name is Hugh Wiley. I'm a, me I'm a member of Soundview, uh, a resident of Soundview Lane. I went through this protracted process uh, with the town and with Homeland Towers. Um, the first thing I would say, and I speak on behalf of the town and on behalf of the residents, even though I'm not an adjacent homeowner, needless to say, to this tower. First thing I would suggest here by way of due diligence to the town and proper process, and I know there's a lot of latitude here for Selectman Moynihan, is that... Um, the first selectmen support our local planning and zoning guidelines for our cell towers. In our process, I was privy to a video in which Nick Williams was part of, and he countered your opinion on this, where Nick Williams asked you whether you would support our local P and Z guidelines for cell towers. Now, at the beginning of this process and this meeting, it was claimed by Homeland Towers that the Connecticut Siting Council has all powers and decisions to sell towers. That may or may not may or may, or may not be true, but I would like and I would like to believe in the due process of our government, state and local, that they would take advice from our leadership, from our mayor from our first selectman of our town. Looking back on our Soundview situation, we might have had a situation where we would have, would have had better screening. We might have had an option where we would have had a monopole option as opposed to a faux Christmas tree option. But you, refre you, you refused first selectman in that video, which is taped, to comment whether or not you would support. In fact, you said you, you inferred that you would not support our planning and zoning guidelines, which by the way, were made in a hurry up fashion when the Soundview Lane cell tower was planned and constructed. And we can go back another, another time on a timeline on that. The reason that that's important for this neighborhood on the west side is that you need to understand that your first selectman can and should be influential on behalf of your interests here. This is not a slam dunk where you just put a pole in the ground. 
without the requirements and the thoughtful thinking of your planning and zoning commission that has put thought and process into the process. Um, I would say on that basis that I'm delighted tonight that you have a balloon test. We were not afforded a balloon test on Soundview Lane. I find it ironic that you have a balloon test today under COVID requirements, but we did not get a balloon test at Soundview Lane when we had the same COVID restrictions. And let me tell you folks, you may, not be, you may or may not be in the same position, but first select Moynihan and Homeland Towers. I look out of every one of my front windows in my home on Soundview Lane and the side windows pointing one direction and I look at a cell tower complete with all of its pods every day, every night, every morning, word of warning. I would also ask you as neighbors to look at the details very carefully. Screening as provided by Homeland, and we will follow up with that as Soundview neighbors, is inadequate. Yes, we have wood screening. It doesn't cover the generator. It doesn't cover the electrical boxes. It still looks like an industrial complex. So take a look at the details. You can talk about the broad strokes. You can talk about the medical issues. They're all important. You can talk about the property values. The Connecticut Siting Council won't listen to those. I understand the safety issues involved, but you have to get involved with the weeds here. And that's all I have to say, but first selectmen, please jump in and represent our neighborhood on both sides. Thank you. Thank you, you. Um, next. John. If you don't have the, the full name, uh, you won't be recognized. So please change your Zoom so we can identify you. Anybody? Maybe they can state their name. Maybe they don't know how to make that change. Can they put in the in the chat? Is it chat disabled? Right. John I can hear us. John Icon. Is there a phone number? Oh, it just says John's icon, and it's lower now, so I'm not sure. Uh, would any of our public safety officials wish to uh, comment? Chief Karlikowski is here in the, in the, our chief of police. Thank you, Leon, for being here. Thank you. I, uh, I appreciate the uh, opposition and concern of uh, the neighbors in this area, but I'm, uh, I'm supporting this from a personal basis and also a professional basis. Personally, I live in the northwest area of town, not too far from this site, and uh, I have virtually no cell phone service at my house. Um, if I didn't have a booster through the internet, I wouldn't have any cell phone service. So I'm um, hopeful this will dramatically improve that and it will enhance the safety for myself, my family, and my neighbors. Uh, separately, professionally, I've responded to many emergencies in that general area, and the cell phone coverage is non-existent, and the radio coverage, if our radio system is antennas are placed in that tower, will be improved dramatically. Right now, it's a temporary site, and it's improved, but this permanent site will help our officers respond to emergencies there. We've had fatal accidents there. We've had a home invasion in that area, lots of emergencies. Uh, this is really a public safety issue. And I get the folks don't want this tower in the backyard. I appreciate that. Um, but from a public safety perspective, um, this is a dire need and I'm supportive of it. Thank you, Chief. You're welcome. Anyone else, uh, Jack or? Uh, uh, Victor, are you? Did you open? Uh, yes. Can you hear me okay? Yes, Victor. Oh, good. Thank you. Sorry, there may be a Zoom issue. I was having a hard time uh, raising my hand, so I'm glad I was able to. 
uh, and others may have a challenge uh, voicing their uh, thoughts and concerns as well. I, uh, so my name is Victor Caliba. I live at 46 Clearview Lane, which is about a half a mile from the proposed site. Uh, I stand and my family stands and neighbors to benefit from this. Uh, we have zero cell phone coverage where we are, but uh, I wanna be clear that we are opposed to it. Uh, it does not seem fair or right that we would do this to members of our community uh, and impact their property values adversely, impact their uh, families adversely, their health and wellness adversely. Uh, this is something that we would never want to have happen to us uh, and we would not want to have happen to our neighbors in this community. Uh, so my strong preference would be that we not do this and, uh, and we will uh, proceed in the absence of any cell coverage rather than uh, you know, have our friends and members of community uh, suffer this way as, as we would expect would occur when this tower is built. Thank you, Victor, for your comment. Any further comments from the public? Newhouse. Bob Newhouse. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, my name is Bob Newhouse. I live at 331 Dan's Highway. And I want to echo what uh, Mark Bushman said and Justin and Jane and Rose and Victor um, that this, I think, is a very bad decision. And I want to also comment that I think the political process here was abysmal and embarrassing. I reached out when I heard about it. Uh, and I got brushed off by the process, um, and it's uh, really disappointing as a new Canaan homeowner to, to see this process. Thank you. We have a Chad McClure. Hello, this is Chad McClure uh, over on Turtleback. I'd rather not give my formal address. Um, can you just comment on the type of the tau or the type of the frequency? Uh, is, it, is it 5G? Will it be 5 g wide? And then also, going back to the, uh, so two questions, going back to the coverage map, can you comment on how many households, or at least appro approximately how many households, would actually benefit from the tower itself? This is uh, Martin Levin, um, C-squared on behalf of AT&T. Um, the Population data we have uh, is based on population only, so we don't have households. Um, our high level of coverage benefits 476 uh, population by our analysis, and the adequate level is newly provided to 1,690. Uh, we don't have it by household. Um, we have John Chris. John Chris is a member of the Planning and Zoning Commission. Yes, hello. Um, thank you, uh, Board Selectman Moynihan. Um, a few points I would like to make. Um, first of all, if you read out, as uh, Chairman Goodwin noted, uh, uh, the Planning and Zoning Commission does have uh, detailed commentary on what uh, we believe is an appropriate um, uh, size and location and other aspects of uh, cell towers. And this is all in our uh, regulations, which have been recently updated. And uh, I would note that the, and note to people on this call, is that the Connecticut Signing Council has so jurisdiction. While they're required to take cognizance of zoning rules, um, what they do with that is really up to them. I would uh, strongly encourage the uh, applicant as well as the Connecticut Signing Council to look uh, in detail at the uh, zoning rules that the Planning and Zoning Commission of Canaan has regarding cell towers and uh, urge them to uh, give full deference to those. A few points I would like to uh, make though regarding that. One uh, is that may not be known broadly, but Ponus Ridge was originally a Native American trail, similar to Broadway in New York. If you've wondered why Broadway weaves around so much is that it was originally a trail avoiding hills and swamps and so forth. Uh, Ponus Ridge is also an Indian trail or was originally. 
And uh, because this was a well-traveled uh, thoroughfare by uh, indigenous peoples of our area, uh, there is a potential for a heightened likelihood of historical artifacts and Native American artifacts uh, along the trail, including where this uh, installation is intended to go. And so this is something that the Connecticut Siting Council and that the applicant, I think, should um, uh, be particularly cognizant of. In addition, uh, I would uh, suggest- John you, John, you realize the trail was moved when they flooded uh, the, the reservoir. You know, the Lost District is, is gone because it, it's where the original road was. Well, I am on 1370 Ponus Ridge, 1.2 miles south, uh, which is part of it. And so trails move around, but since it's near a trail, I suggest this is something they may want to uh, certainly be sensitive to when they're doing excavations. Also, um, there are things that the applicant can do in order to, uh, if the Connecticut Siding Council and its wisdom decides to go ahead with this, to um, try to minimize the impact of the uh, installation. One is that um, the pole uh, can be as well camouflaged as possible. Often in these things, there's the silver level, the platinum level, and the gold level, and other levels. And so uh, that can be um, potentially enhanced. Also regarding the landscaping, in order to hide the uh, physical installation, not the pole since it's so tall, but the um, uh, physical structures on the ground, um, that uh, native plantings be used, particularly those that are uh, very um, helpful to wildlife. Uh, this is something that we discuss in our planning and zoning uh, regulations, as well as our plan of conservation and development. That's a very easy thing to do. It doesn't really cost you anything extra. Um, as well as uh, a fence that is not a chain link fence, but something a lot nicer, uh, that any noise emitted from the site be as muffled as, as possible. And also that the physical installation on the site, the cabin, um, can be designed in such a way so that it is um, consistent with the uh, with uh, adjoining structures. Often these are um, constructed in the way that looks like a, a small barn or an old-fashioned shed, and uh, that tends to uh, soften the impact. So these are things that the uh, applicant may wish to uh, consider as uh, part of its uh, part of its application. But I, I would suggest strongly that the applicant and the siting council take full cognizance to the planning and zoning uh, regulations that we have in this town. Uh, thank you for selecting them. Michael, report. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great, thank you. Um, so um, my name is Michael Report. I live at 40 River Wind Road. So I don't know exactly how far that is from the proposed site, but it's fairly close. Um, you know, we're, my wife and I are fairly new to the town and we're new to this process. So I, I don't think we can really comment on frankly the visibility, um, the property value issue, or even the process that some other folks have commented on. Um, but we do have great sympathy for folks who are going to be affected by this tower going up and, and our neighbors who are gonna be close to it. So we're, we obviously recognize that the, the impact that that may have and, and understand and appreciate their concerns. Um, what I did wanna say though is that there is a safety consideration for us, which is that we have a couple of young kids, like a lot of people do. And if, if a tree comes down on Lake Wind or River Wind Road and takes out our cable line, we are cut off. Um, and it's this is not sort of a theoretical point. This actually happened last year, fortunately for us, before we had actually moved into the house, but a, a tree came down and cut off access to the road. And if we had been in the house with a cable line up and no what cell phone service, we would have been stuck there with no ability to reach anyone on the outside. Um, just the other day, my father-in-law was driving down Ponus Ridge and a tree had come down on Ponus Ridge just at the crest of one of the big hills between Dan's Highway and, uh, and Lost District in a very dangerous location where somebody who was going just a little too fast would have come over that road and hit that tree without any sort of warning. And he was unable to make a call to the police or anyone else when he was there to try to warn them um, of, of the potential risk. So fortunately he was able to get to our house and, and we were, he was able to make the call from there. 
Um, so I do think that this is a very significant public safety issue from our standpoint. Um, and so I realize a lot of people are opposed, but I just wanted to register at least our support for this project because um, we, we view it as pretty fundamental um, to safety in Northwestern New Canaan. Um, but I also agree with John's recent comments about how mitigating the impact on those of our neighbors who are gonna be affected most and who are closest to it needs to be carefully thought through. So those are my comments. Thank you. Bob Smith. Hi, good evening. Um, I live on Squires Lane and I just wanna provide comment for the record and echo what uh, my neighbors have already said. Um, and, and just please put yourselves in our shoes. There's probably about 14 kids who live within a football field's distance of the cell tower. The tower is going to be 293 feet from my house. And we are in a position where uh, we have no power to influence the location of this tower other than pleading to, to this body to take into account uh, the welfare of our children and the impact on the lives that we have. And we would just ask you to be open-minded that there is more than one solution to a given problem. And while this one seems easy and right in front of you, there might be other ways that can solve the safety issue while also taking into account the real human impacts that this project will likely have. So please um, please be open-minded to that and, and thanks for your consideration. Thank you, Ben. Um, Maureen. Maureen, we need a last name. Hi, it's Maureen Fuhr, and I live on 49 White Fall Lane. And um, I'm concerned about safety, but, um, you know, for the, I live fairly close to the tower, and I'm concerned about the radio frequency radiation exposure. Um, and I'm not, I don't know if you're aware of the FDA study that was done from 2008 to 2018. Um, it was the longest of its kind, uh, $30 million study. And they did find an increased risk of cancer, DNA damage. Uh, there are also other studies that found oxidative stress, um, radiation sickness, sperm damage, blood brain barrier damage, birth defects, increased risk of heart attack. So um, this has been very concerning to me because um, I'm very aware of these kinds of things because my son has special needs. So I just feel like nobody is looking out for the people that live around the cell tower and the long-term damage that uh, this radio frequency radiation exposure can do. Uh, in fact, also the World Health Organization has said that it has a negative impact on the human body and can cause cancer. So um, just something that I think, you know, we need to look into. I, I have, you know, more studies, but uh, it's something that's extremely concerning to me and my family and everybody who lives around the tower. Thank, Thank you. you okay. Yes, good evening, uh, Julia Flanagan, 1937 Ponus Ridge. Wanted it on the record, um, our opposition. Hi, sorry, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, great. Um, wanted to put on the record our opposition to the cell phone tower that is being proposed. Um, would like the first selectman and others to consider um, perhaps a smaller tower uh, to address the safety issues. And also, um, it seems that Mr. Report, I'm not sure if anyone had contacted him um, for the potential of the cell phone tower on his property as he seems in favor. So perhaps we should explore that option. Thank you very much. You know others. Uh, Jack or Albion, did the fire want to make any comment? Or is Jack Horner on? Here, 
He's unmuted, Albert. He can't talk. Hold on. There I go. Albert. Yes. Good evening, everybody. Uh, Assistant Chief Alby Bassett with the Fire Department. Uh, I uh, listen to all everyone's concerns. I understand them. But on behalf of um, the public safety, uh, the, the need for uh, communications uh, for, for us to do our job and police department, as the chief already mentioned, uh, the, the cell communications now are critical along with the radio communications. So that's, we're asking for support for that. Uh, I did want to comment on that that IF, IFF study, yes, the, uh, the Firefighters Association uh, did ask for a study and nothing concrete's co come out of that, but those were towers that the firefighters were working under and, and in for 24 hours working underneath the towers. Um, so some of those studies, we need to see how far they're away um, from them. So again, support for our communications. And the, as the one resident said, uh, our, the need for cell coverage for, to report an emergency. And now that the town is also pushing out emergency information for the uh, residents to stay in or to evacuate and so on uh, is critical through the cell system. So that's all I have, sir. Thank you, Albie. Anyone else? Okay, that concludes our uh, public input, uh, but there's opportunities to comment up until February 14th. So if anybody wants to submit um, written comments, I'm sure any comments you receive, you'll consider in terms of whether you modify your application to the Siting Council. That's correct. And, and the Siting Council uh, process is also a public hearing. Um, folks can attend that hearing, they can submit comments to the Siting Council in writing and they will be considered. So uh, it's not, February 14th is not a deadline for comments. Uh, comments will be received uh, throughout the process. Right, so there'll be a public hearing probably in April, May, June uh, by the Siting Council, possibly in, in this room, if they go back to their practice of doing local okay. hearings. Otherwise, the Sound View Lane was, was done by Zoom. Um, and in some ways you get bit more input from people who, don't find it convenient to travel to a, uh, uh, so the, the for the process, as I said, planning is only tomorrow night, we'll discuss the matter as part of their agenda. Any concluding comments, Kathleen? A couple Nick? questions, yeah. if that's okay. No questions, yeah. yeah. Okay, so if, thank you. Uh, thank you to everybody uh, for their input, which um, we certainly value very much. Um, and while this is a, certainly a public safety issue, um, public input is also gratefully appreciated and we very much respect everybody's opinion here. I just, if, if you could help me understand a little bit about the Siting Council uh, in terms of the process and the time. So the first selectman described it could be a meeting and here there's lots of opportunity for further input. Two questions, what's the um, relative, amount of time from when you submit your uh, findings and report to typically, and then they'll have their open meeting, to typically when they make their decisions, one question. And then how often is the input from, say, the community, from neighbors and so forth, how often does that actually impact some of the things that they will find reasons to uh, find mitigating uh, factors in which they can improve the situation? Do you see much of that at all? Yes. Okay. Um, so to answer your second question first, absolutely. In the okay. Siting Council, uh, they, they do take uh, input from the, uh, the town and the residents uh, in very seriously when they evaluate a proposal. And there are times when an applicant will, will have to modify their proposal in order to accommodate a request from the Siting Council that came through um, some comments. So uh, yes, it does happen. With respect to timelines, uh, it, it depends <clears throat> on how busy the Siting Council is, uh, how soon they can schedule a hearing. It's a little bit more difficult when you're trying to schedule it in person. Obviously, it has to be a time that's convenient for the town. So um, from the time we file to a decision, uh, depending upon who gets involved, it could be three months, it could be six months, okay. um, but everything is noticed in advance. Uh, so everybody has an opportunity to know um, exactly when the hearing is going to happen, 
what format it's going to take, what deadlines there are, and so forth. So I think what we're hearing a little bit of anyway is just making sure that the communication is, is paramount right. so that everybody recognizes when that where right. we are along the process and so forth. And we'll certainly do our very best to make sure that that's communicated right. to the community. So we're at the very beginning of the process. We're at the very beginning of the process. Okay. 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 Very good. Nick, do you want to make a comment? Sure. As I said at the outset, you know, <clears throat> this is, this is a, an emergency issue. Uh, we had a few years ago before Albie joined us as fire chief, but I'm sure he knows his story. We had a house fire uh, and we had a resident, and this is in the northeast por portion of town, um, who cell phone, didn't have cell phone coverage, had to get into his car, drive three miles to the south and call 911. Um, you know, it is of imperative importance that we you know, move this issue forward. I am, I have great sympathy and empathy for the folks uh, in the neighborhood. Uh, I will say, and Mark Bushman, <laughs> I had to have a chuckle when you talked about, um, you know, what if I had a cell phone tower on my property or Kevin's property? I actually invited AT&T uh, to come on to my property to, to explore um, hosting a cell phone tower. Um, and for, for good or bad, that, that wasn't, viewed as being a, um, an op, uh, op, optimal site to have a tower. Um, listen, um, Hugh Wiley mentioned my comments about supporting RPNZ. RPNZ in, in, in the wake of, or even before Soundview uh, you know, became ripe, changed, updated their guidance with respect to, to cell phone towers. Um, and I think it's really important that the neighbors on the call tonight who are in opposition to this tower, and I understand it, um, look very carefully at what PNZ did. I think look very carefully at the Soundview process in order to inform themselves going forward. You, there are, there is the opportunity to make changes. And I think we've talked about potential changes um, that have been made to Soundview. So um, I, I wanna thank everybody for their participation uh, tonight. I'd like to make one final comment because um, Kathleen and I served on the town council together for four years before um, I became for selectman four years ago. And, and um, you know, the town of New Canaan has, has committed to solving this problem. That's why we went out for an RFP with, uh, and chose Homeland Towers to work with us to, to solve this problem. Um, I would urge you to talk to some of the neighbors in, for example, around Silver Hill Hospital. Initially, people op opposed that tower. Um, concerned about property values, concerning about appearance. Um, people ought to realize downtown, uh, AT&T and Verizon have uh, antennas that are 55 feet above the ground. People live within 100 feet of, the, of, of those antennas. Um, so, you know, cell service requires uh, cell, cell antennas. Um, and uh, you can't be a modern town, you can't be a safe town without cell service. So we have two or three more towers coming um, in the western part of town and back downtown. So um, I committed to try to solve this problem. It's something the town has an obligation to solve. We try to pick the most discreet uh, locations we can possibly find. And when you're in a residential neighborhood, that means someone's gonna be close to the, to, the, uh, to the tower. But I think this is about the most discreet possible location as indicated by the, uh, the view sightings that uh, was, was analyzed. And uh, at the end of the day, um, we can't live without good cell service. We can't be a modern town without it. And um, so I, I, think, I think people should talk to people who have existing towers nearby. Um, when it's right in your backyard, I absolutely appreciate it. Someone's gonna be the nearest, nearest neighbor. But, but concerns about health, um, uh, you know, we, have, we have cell towers, cell antennas uh, ringing, waving a water tank uh, right next to the high school. Um, and you know, if, we thought, if I thought this was a health risk, um, I wouldn't be supporting this. So um, thank you for your participation. Um, and you, there's more opportunity to comment, more opportunity with the Siting Council to make people's concerns known. So thank you for, for participating tonight. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Appreciate your time. Appreciate it. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Mm -hmm.